<laughs> Welcome to another edition of Anglican Unscripted, the Tuesday edition, episode 635. I'm Kevin Carlson. And I'm George Conga, and today's December 8th, 2020. All right, people out there in the Anglican Christian world, I guess we have many denominations that watch us, so I can't uh, just single you out, I'm sorry. All the Christians who watch us, hi there. Uh, people keep asking where I am this week. We are just outside of uh, Cape Coral, which is uh, south of Fort Myers, Florida, where today we woke up and it was a little chilly. It was 52 degrees, George. How do you handle these these temperature extremes? Well, we don't. Uh <laughs> If you went outside this morning, it was 46 in our part of Florida, and the world has closed. It's as if there was a tsunami snowstorm. Uh, we were in, I don't know, northern Canada, and the public transport had stopped, schools are closed. Uh, we have a snow emergency. You know, it's, 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 snow here. Yeah, no, it's, well, it's, it's so it's, cold, life stops until it gets above 60. It's like COVID phase one in, until uh, the, the temperature returns to normal here. Um, so before we get too far into the show, please like the show. If you see us on YouTube or Facebook, if you have not subscribed yet, and we're doing really well with subscribers, but if you're one of the few people who watch us and haven't subscribed, now's your chance to express yourself in the kindness of subscribing. Click on the red rectangle on the YouTube channel and then click on the uh, little bell that pops up and you will get notifications whenever there is a new episode. And go to the comment section. You guys all belong in the comment section. We get like maybe a hundred comments per show and we get you know two, three thousand, sometimes four thousand viewers. We should have like three thousand comments. You guys need to participate. There's a lot that happens in the comment section. That's where the show continues. George, welcome to Tuesday. How's your week going so far? It's been very cold. Um, I'm pleased. We mailed out our uh, pledge uh, requests, and I got the first uh, batch in. I just need about 150 more, and I'll be happy. <laughs> uh, oh, my. But the... Uh, uh, we've had we now have all our services outside and i heard from the organist today that the choir doesn't want to do an inside service on christmas eve uh -huh. so we'll be outside on christmas eve as well with the candles outside in our uh, uh paved garden area well that's kind of so, cool so, well no, we bat we're baptizing babies burying people life goes on uh best we can but everything's outside or socially distanced well since we recorded our last show uh COVID infections have gone up, hospitalizations have gone up, states have continued to shut down. The number one uh, bad state now as of today is Connecticut, and I'm not there. Uh, and it's just, it's amazing how persistent this uh, um, disease is and how, uh, you know, people are continuing to get it because it, it's just so damn contagious. And uh, for many of those who get it, it doesn't have any effects. I have a good friend who, uh, who got it last week, and all he did was lose his sense of smell. And we read about other people who uh, go into ICU and, and go there to die. It's just one of those strange, it's, it's not tonsillitis. It's not, you know, something simple, George. It's a, it's a difficult disease that um, we're watching everybody drop the ball on. I'm, I'm not happy with the governments and how they're handling it. Uh, we've complained about how the church has handled this. Uh, it, it's just, it's a mess. And I, I see the frustration really breaking out on Facebook. I'm tired of it all. I'm sick of it all, you know? And we just saw a report published uh, Friday that mental health is at a 20 year low, which means since Bill Clinton was president. But yeah. <laughs> It's bad, George. It's really bad. What are you seeing? Well, this is Florida, so it's wonderful here. <laughs> yes. um, we have no lockdowns. We have no restrictions. Everything's voluntary. The schools will close because of the cold, but not because of COVID. But we are seeing some residual effects. Uh, we have reports in our local newspaper that a large number relatively large number of high school students have dropped out of high school because it's now 
part online, part in person. And the marginal kids who sort of need the rigor and discipline of going to school every, every day, uh, they don't have it. And so they're, we're basically sowing the seeds of a dysfunctional generation to come of poorly educated children who are not getting the regular poor education that they should be getting. But, um, well, in Florida, we're very lucky, uh, both with uh, we have a good government and we've not been really ravaged by the disease. Um, but we are seeing the effects of it. The other effect we're seeing is housing prices going through the roof as people are fleeing the Northeast. Uh, coming down here, I have realtors in the congregation who tell me that people will call them and buy a house over the phone uh, in some of our developments around here just to have a place to escape to next time New York City goes into lockdown, next time if New Jersey shuts down completely, uh, they want to go to a place where they can live. Yeah, I mean, and unfortunately, that's how the infection will get here. Um, our first round of infections came because of people from the Northeast, New York, New Jersey. And we'll probably get another batch here in the next uh, month. My frustration comes in, in, at the government level with them having requirements. I don't mind them recommending and saying, listen, COVID's really bad and we recommend you wear a face mask. We recommend you uh, conduct yourself in, in this way. It's when they had the requirements and they had the mandatory shutdowns of restaurants and businesses. I think that's where I, as a conservative Reagan Republican, I, 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 I'm very uncomfortable with that. And I think it's it's really, it's gone too far. And now there's no way to pull back. You've wrecked the economy. Uh, you haven't solved anything, and now we're just going through wave and wave and wave, waiting for the vaccine. And I, I understand that frustration people are having. We're seeing it within the parish life. We've had we had a member of our vestry resign. He demanded that we shut the church completely, mm -hmm. and uh, the vestry discussed this. And essentially, it was uh, nine to one. Uh, no, we'll stay open. And that. The thinking is that so long as one person wishes to worship in community, we will have our doors open. But your but your Sunday obligation to worship here is relaxed. Uh, uh, thank you, Bishop in Orlando, for that. <laughs> but you know, my duty as a priest is to be here, no matter my particular thoughts or feelings on the efficacy of COVID vaccines or shutdowns and lockdowns. So long as someone. Uh, is led by the Spirit to worship in community, then this church must have its doors open. And, of course, we take precautions. Uh, we worship outside. I preach with a face mask on. Now, I do that because I'm a very demonstrative, emotional person, and I walk around the congregation with the front of the congregation. Sure. And there was this one little old lady uh, who I... who. If I if I think she was itching to go get a broom from the closet and sort of fend me off if I got too close with her as I was, you know, being dramatic and waving my arms and preaching hellfire and damnation, which I love to do. Well, do, do, but, do you have like the, the spittle rolls where, you, where you, the first three rolls you're likely to get the, the George spit as I preach or? Well, we have the... Uh, uh, we have the people with hearing aids sit towards the back. I don't you we don't use the sound system even outside because my I have a my voice is could carry and it echoes off the Very building walls. Voice. You yes. don't need sound. Um but uh we do have I did have one person who said I can't come anymore because your ear my you hurt my ears and uh Okay, I've heard everything, but uh, <laughs> That's a new hey, why not? <laughs> wow. Um what else do I want to talk about real quick? Uh, it, you know, it completely uh, came and went. Let's move on to the news. Uh, we had talked uh, last week about the uh, East Coast of Africa having so many difficulties right now with uh, terrorism and uh, revolts and just Christians being killed, uh, especially some of the farmers in Nigeria. Uh, there's more breakouts now in Congo. Uh, and I thought we talked about... Yeah, around the... the continent there and i think it's time to talk about this because now the state department is paying attention that's how that's how bad it's getting. it's gone beyond anglican scripted the state department is now on on board with us 
Yes, the uh, U.S. State Department labeled Nigeria as a country of specific concern and among the 10 worst violators of religious freedom in the world. And that is because of the persecution of Christians by ISIS, Boko Haram, whatever incarnation this uh, by the uh, tribe, uh, by the uh, the farming, uh, by the uh, herding tribesmen, the mm-hmm. also Muslim tribesmen, uh, Fulani, the uh, tribesmen, that's what they're called. Uh, Nigeria is now a place where Christians, the United States government, recognizes that they are being singled out and persecuted and the state is not doing its job in protecting them. So this is not just, well, there's always going to be violence, always going to be unhappiness. Now, the Nigerian government has failed in the in, in the eyes of the U.S. government in protecting its citizens from religious persecution, which is a big step in the battle for for Christians in Nigeria because they can now say to their government, look, it's not just us complaining. Um, we have the United States saying you, President Buhari, are doing a crappy job. Now, here's the funny thing. Under the uh, Obama administration, John Kerry, as Secretary of State, would go to Nigeria and meet with religious leaders. And the, the thing was, the last two times he did that, he only met with Muslim religious leaders. Mm-hmm. And he spoke about how the United States government was friends with Muslims. Uh, Secretary Pompeo, under the Obama, under the Trump administration, has made it very clear to President Buhari that the U.S. Uh, assistant, military assistance, economic assistance, the, the things, the carrots that we can offer to a developing country will be withdrawn unless they clean up their act and protect Christian farmers uh, from the predations of uh, Boko Haram, the predations of Fulani tribesmen who are destroying farms, killing people because of religion. Which is different because the Obama administration used uh, the threat of um, a little buzz in here. Something behind your microphone over there? No? Okay. Oh, probably a, f- a phone, <laughs> a phone message. Oh, the phone's ringing. Okay. Um, the Obama administration would force countries to recognize LGTB rights um, and other things before you could get the money. Here, just protect your Christians or we're going to pull the money out. And so... Uh, well, it, the, other big differ- the other big difference is that uh, under uh, John Kerry, as Secretary of State, and then uh, Hillary Clinton, the United States official policy was that the problem in Nigeria was not religious. It was driven by climate change. Under the Trump administration, we have the official policy is the problem is religious. Yes, there are elements of desertification in the north, but at the end of the day, these tribesmen are not attacking Muslim farmers. They're attacking Christian farmers. Uh, uh, to sort of take this a little bit forward, there was an instance. There's a new president of the Republic of the Seychelles, which is an African island nation in the Indian Ocean. And its new its new uh, prime minister, president, excuse me, is an Anglican priest. Now, he's been non stipendiary for 20 years. He's been leader of the opposition. And the Seychelles is not really on the top-level U.S. government map. It's dealt with by the, the professional staffers at the State Department. The new president of the Seychelles says one of the things he wants to introduce is permit same-sex marriage. Now, the church in the province of the Indian Ocean doesn't recognize same-sex marriage. But what the Seychelles is going to do is allow same-sex marriage for foreigners. So just like you have casino gambling in the Bahamas, yeah. but Bahamians can't go into the casinos, you're going they basically want to have gay tourism have the seychelles be a wedding destination for homosexual couples and they'll get money from the u.s government if they allow them to do this because the middle and bottom layers of the state department are still fully part of the deep state yes they are uh, that has uh, rebelled against President Trump's policies from the moment he walked into the White House. And released all the tapes with foreign uh, presidents. Uh, all the secret tapes that Trump had were released by all these uh, uh, lower level uh, State Department people. It, it's just amazing. You, know, you don't believe in a swamp when you look at it from the, the 30,000 foot level. But boy, when you get down into the, the DC, there is a swamp. Now, George, what's interesting now that I'm here in Florida, 
Okay, where you have swamp land, uh, I go for my little bicycle rides on your little gravel trails around uh, these swamps. They actually have these big uh, drainage valves where you can actually drain a swamp into the different lakes. And I'm like, well, it's possible. Uh, Trump was not really able to do it, but uh, there is the concept of draining the swamp. He just didn't pull that out of thin air. Um, it just DC is just too much water <laughs> to drain, I guess. Uh, did you want to say something before we move to our next story? Well, I wanted to stay in Africa, but this time talk about Pope. Yeah, let's t let's talk about uh, the Roman Catholic issues and. Uh, in Africa, not just the east coast of Africa, but more South Africa, the Pope, as reported, has said that it's okay to bring into cultural expression in the Roman Catholic Eucharist those in African nations. And I'm like, oh, this is Pachamama. This is, this is South America being brought back into the Eucharist, and what good can come of this, George? Well, our favorite Episcopalian, Pope Francis, uh, <laughs> is, t it, oh man, this man just typifies the trajectory of the Episcopal Church over the past 30 years. The arguments, the issues are all things that we have lived through, fought over, been there, done that. What are we talking about? Well, in the Catholic Church in the Congo, they have the Zairean Rite. Um, it's a local Eucharistic rite where they make mention of their ancestors. Now, what the Catholic Church in the Congo has done is baptized local custom and worship. So our ancestors, we're honoring, we're calling them now members of the communion of saints. So they're basically importing cultural practices. And Francis has recommended this approach for the Amazonian Synod and the Amazonian Catholic Church, which was the epicenter of the Pachamama debate at the Amazonian Synod uh, in Rome, where you had the uh, pagan Virgin Mary uh, statue and everything. So Francis is bringing this back, uh, but he's doing it in a rather crafty way by saying that an African exception that, that sort of baptizes his Christian uh, you know, baptizes the local understanding of our communion of saints and our ancestors. Francis is not being clear about what about the Zairean right you can run with. So his defenders will be able to say, well, it's just this. Well, Cardinal Casper and the Brazilian bishops will be able to say, well, this means we're allowed to incorporate milk and honey in the Eucharist and speak to the mother, mother Earth. Now, why do I say we've been there and done that? About 15 years ago, 20 years ago, we had a major shift in the Anglican world in Africa. Desmond Tutu was the giant of the African church. Now, Desmond, because of his leadership in the uh, anti-apartheid regime, he was a world figure probably the first African bishop since August, Augustine, Augustine to be a world figure. Absolutely. Now, Desmond Tutu was right on politics in some sense, but wrong on just about everything else. So the African church didn't push back against any of the liberal liberalizing tendencies that we were getting from the North because Tutu was happy with it. Tutu supports gay marriage. Tutu you know, he's down the line uh, with all this stuff. Well, Tutu retires, and we saw this at Lambeth 98. And in 98, the new South African Archbishop, Njankula Ndungane, wanted to take the mantle of leadership, and the Nigerians wrested it away. And the issue was enculturation. There, in some South African dioceses, they were permitting newly consecrated bishops to have pagan practices from the local tribes incorporated into the ritual so that one bishop they sacrificed a bull sl slid its throat at the altar in front of the altar as a propitiation of the ancestral spirits and things like that the episcopal church uh 
you go to a diocesan convention in Los Angeles and they have these Indians burning sagebrush. Kevin, do you remember the Ch- Catherine Jefford Shorey consecration in Washington? Yes, with these spirits dancing through the aisles in the installation. Yes, that was that was a, an amazing uh, proclamation of everything pagan. Yeah. I mean, I I had troubles going back 10 years before that with some deacon holding a giant pole with a little bird on a string (laughs) representing the Holy Spirit. I just thought that was tacky. I didn't know it would develop into this full-fledged bringing in paganism and trying, not even baptizing paganism, but being so woke and uh, beholden to indigenous culture. Well, the fight in Africa was the the Nigerians said, yes, we want an Africanized church, but that means Nigerians running the church, not Englishmen, not Americans. And it does not mean bringing in the pagan things that the missionaries rescued us from. So the Nigerian church in particular was quite adamant of pushing back against things like the South African versions of the Congolese Eucharistic rite, or bringing in ancestral worship, or bringing in all this stuff. Um, so we've been there, we've done that, but within the Af- but with- in Africa, it was smacked down. But in the Catholic world, it's being encouraged by the man at the top who's saying, you people in the Amazon, you can have Pachamama because we let the Congolese uh, call their ancestors members of the communion of saints. Well, the New Testament definitely wants us to have a boundary. Be in the world, but not of the world. And I think the church has always kind of wrestled with, you know, kind of in the shadows where it belongs. And uh, I think taking this into the Eucharist is just a bit too far, George. And uh, we shall see what happens. Oh, no, I I know what's going to happen. Here's what's going to happen. The Episcopal Church is forecasted to uh, run out of business in 2050. I'm thinking 2040, but 2050. I say the Roman Catholic Church shortly after that will close their doors as well, uh, just remaining, uh, you know, they'll, they'll keep the Vatican open. Uh, but if you're going to go well, down Kevin, I road, feel like that. <laughs> go ahead. I think, my, I think Shepherd of the Hills is going to be the, the, like the last blockbuster video store still open in Bend, Oregon. <laughs> the rest of the chain have collapsed, but they're not friends. There is a blockbuster video still going very successful in this little town in West, in Eastern Oregon. Get my little so, VHS. Yes, uh, do you guys still do beta or just VHS? <sighs> Kevin, we still have video kits. We still have uh, tape cassettes. And <laughs> That's right. Cassettes. Beta. Super. Uh, <laughs> all this stuff. Uh, my, my point is, uh, yes, you're going to see massive uh, demographic decline across the Episcopal Church because we're not re- re- replacing people. Some churches are. Um, and we'll just see what's what the shakeout brings in the, in the future. All right. I'm going back to the Anglican.inc site to look for other news to talk about. Um, get something uh the church society we could probably talk about that next week we've been contacted by um people in the anglican futures uh group it's a new group in the uh in england and they want to uh let us know about what's happening there we'll talk about i'm going to try to get an interview with them sometime this week so we'll talk more about that separately but from what i can gather they're restructuring or reforming. Do you know anything about that, George? I just had a chance to breeze an email on to you. Well, uh, AMIE has, I don't want to say folded, but it's its it being transformed right. into a new entity. Okay. Uh, they, had to let, they had to let their staffer go. Um, they've chartered a new not-for-profit uh, ministry. Sure, sure. So the church is on the ground seem to be doing okay some doing better than others uh but this the whole covid close down is it's an equal opportunity church killer um the uh yes we'll get people say well our church is doing just fine in covid and this and that um well, that's wonderful to hear exceptions, but across the board, but it, the vast majority of churches are being damaged well, diocese financially, too. spiritually, diocese. We talked last um, week about uh, diocese not being able to really communicate through technology in this time of COVID. 
And I read this week that uh, the Diocese of Pittsburgh, the Anglican Diocese of Pittsburgh, has uh, eliminated three staff positions. And three you know, canons, not three just canons. not three secret, not two secretaries and a janitor, three yeah. canons. So there's retrenchment, detrenching of churches, institutions going around, and we need to figure out what the future is going to look like. And AMIE is uh, getting a start on this. How are we to function in a post COVID world? And good for them because I haven't seen the Episcopal Church figure out how it's going to function in a post COVID world. It wasn't do, doing too great pre COVID, mm -hmm. but in other words, we have a general convention that meets every two, every three years that costs three, four million dollars that gets thousands of people out and spends a week talking about whether or not we should back a parole for a mumia abu jamal a cop killer in philadelphia in other words just basically waste of time stuff um is that necessary what what do you do with the diocese of western kansas that has a bishop who now has to double as the parish priest who may have uh, only four or five stipendary priests at what point do you say the Diocese of Western Kansas, the Diocese of Northern Michigan, the Diocese of Eastern Oregon, the Diocese of San Joaquin, Episcopal, or the Diocese of Fort Worth, Episcopal, need to be wrapped into the neighboring diocese because we just can't afford the infrastructure costs. And they're certainly not growing. They're certainly not planting churches. Yeah. But that, that conversation isn't being held and part of the reason why is that the powers that be that run general convention have no interest in seeing their power taken away. We've had the discussion before. It's still about power. You find very few it's about people. power. It's about money. Mm -hmm. um, you know, things are getting tighter, and of course, we'll ha uh, things are getting tighter and tighter and tighter. And so, what does that mean? Well, the National Episcopal Church is getting harder and harder and harder about collecting money. Um, no spiritual leadership, but it runs a great collection agency. It does. I mean, what, in all my travels in the last uh, 12, 14 years, I have met a lot of Episcopalians who are really true believers at the lay level. But once you start getting the canons and the clergy and the hey, bishops, hey, uh, hey, I'm everyone, a canon. I'm a dean. Come on, <laughs> not everyone. Um, you start finding less and less true believers, and more and more people who enjoy—they they may not strive for it, but they enjoy the power. They they enjoy well, showing remember? up in the meetings and being, you know, uh, recognized as for whatever reason, and that's where they get their identification. Well, you remember Catherine Jefford Shorey gave an interview with the New York Times shortly after she became presiding bishop, mm -hmm. where she was t uh, the issue was raised, well, how come you're not growing? And she said, well, Episcopalians are better educated, put a premium on education, therefore we only have one or two children. We're not like these Baptists or Catholics who have seven, eight children. Um, the... One of the problems of the Episcopal way, and I'll say of the Anglican way, is it puts a premium on a degree, being having your wall filled with degrees rather than you having a heart filled with the power of the Holy Spirit. And I don't, I think that having godly priests and godly bishops is less of a uh, priority in many parts of the church than of having politically correct or woke bishops oh isn't it time we had a black female bishop in a wheelchair um that being a criteria rather than holiness and the spirit the person being spirit filled and when you adopt those worldly standards um you're going to suffer the consequences of the world which is collapse decay and death sure uh, but I if, but you know i I, last week, so I got it. Kevin said, "Are you going to get in trouble for saying these things about the diocese?" And I had a priest friend in the diocese said, "Oh, have you heard anything? Is you know, Kevin looked visibly uncomfortable when you were saying these stuff about the diocese of Central Florida has fallen down on the job." The problem is, it's the truth. And how do you fight the truth except by stating it and addressing the issues? Yeah. And if if you can't state the truth as a priest, you know, as my mother-in-law says, George, it's not too late to go back to law school. In the Episcopal Church and the Anglican Church, I think I've had five, maybe six priests so far. 
And I have always been the annoying person to remind the priest that their number one priority was always their relationship with God, their relationship in Christ. That uh, If you can't keep that focus, everything else just becomes chaos and mess. And I think we are really seeing that uh, on an international level in all churches when we kind of lose the focus we lose the Jesus focus and we have you know made famous by uh, Pixar, Pixar uh, and up the squirrel the squirrel you know everything just takes our attention now and well, you know politics. let's let's take it back to the, you know some of our uh, unkind critics say we don't ever have any good things to say about Justin Welby or the new Archbishop of York Stephen Cottrell and I'm going to play into that perception today by saying unkind things about the two of us, who I'm sure are lovely men in person. Stephen Cottrell wrote an article for the uh, Radio Times, which is the English TV guide, the British TV guide. And it was a Christmas number. And here you would expect one of the largest circulation magazines in the UK, you have an opportunity to reach, I don't know, tens of millions of people, certainly millions of people with the Christmas story, the Christmas message. And what you get is the most silly pablum that could come out of a UN uh, children's campaign. Let's be nice to each other. Let's find the goodness in our neighbor. Nothing about the coming of God as man. Nothing particularly Christian. And this is the Archbishop of York. So what do you need? I mean, it's the sort of thing that a a politician says in his in his Christmas message to constituents, it's not what a Christian leader says. Right, and um, no, I, I'm with you. I, I, Jill and I have been touring around Florida. We went to Sea World. Sea World is a secular business where they display uh, aquatic animals for your viewing pleasure. They have dolphins that do little dolphin shows, uh, killer whales that do little killer whale shows. You go all around SeaWorld. The night we were there was the first Christmas uh, lighting Christmas night. And we see that there's like a Christmas pageant. And so let's, let's go to it. And I'm like, oh, Jill, I can't go to this because, you know, it'll just bother me so much. Well, we got in line and we sat through this pageant and it was the Christmas story. The actors asked you to believe. They they, they, they gave you hope through the, this whole thing. And I, I walk out of there and I'm like, I couldn't have gotten that in half the Anglican or Episcopal or Christian churches in America. You know, they, they don't know that Christmas story. And that these actors at SeaWorld who are paid to do this were able to just deliver a wonderful musical number, uh, a pageant, and I came out of there with hope. Well, if SeaWorld can do it, why can't the Christian church in America do it? Oh, the frustration. Yeah, so, <laughs> George, I hear exactly what you're saying. You know, uh, the Archbishop. No leadership. Does, yeah, the no, Archbishop no doesn't know it. Uh, integrity. Hmm? Uh, you know, and now Justin Welby's taken a three-month sabbatical in the midst of a crisis of morality, a crisis of conscience, a crisis in the future of the Anglican world. Now is the time to spend three months uh, studying conflict resolution and playing golf. <laughs> I, I don't know if we'll be playing. I took a college course where uh, one of the uh, weeks of study was the CEOs who left their company for sabbaticals and came back and the company was better better run so maybe that will happen here you know uh, we well the there. bishop of london will be up doing the day-to-day -day stuff uh, and the bishop archbishop of york so i'm not certain the hope is that the second there. tier leadership is an improvement on the first tier uh, yeah, yeah. all right Anything which is a real there? shame because once upon a time that the bishops of the church of england you had your nuts and kooks and they were pleasant and enjoyable but you had real men of in the past of integrity and intellect and character and courage and determination mm -hmm. you had george bell uh stand up in parliament and condemn the bombing of dresden during the second world war when being any way considered pro-german was considered awful mm -hmm. but he did so for sound moral principles and this was a man who took in jewish refugees before the war we can talk about you had force you, know, you know yes you 
where are these men and women in the leadership of the Church of England today? Well, they're there, but they're, but they're not promoted out of parishes because they're not company men, company women, well, mindless drones who add nothing. Uh, I mean, you know, we had this woman bishop, the Bishop of Reading, uh, who we talked about this a few weeks ago, who gives this stuff about creation and nature, and it was actually anti-Christian, but she didn't know any better. She literally did not know any better, but what she was spouting was a denial of the incarnation, that nature is the incarnation. I guarantee she heard that in seminary. That's where she learned it. It's not like she just thought it. You know, this is something, a teaching she brought forward from seminary. Uh, I don't know. Do we have any other news? We're running here really, really late, George. We're at 36 minutes. People have Christmas shopping to do on Amazon. Can't go out in the stores anymore. Uh, what what other news you want to cover? Well, Indian uh, corruption, no, but it's, yeah, that's it'll a, still be there yeah, next week. It. So I'm going to try sometime next week to get an interview with the uh, the reformed organizations happening in England, and uh, I'll post that as it happens. Uh, until then, guys, uh, we do pray for your safety in these COVID times. We remind you that uh, Christ is in charge. Uh, even though it's difficult to recognize that, I recognize that. I'm Kevin Coulson. And I'm George Conger. And you've been watching episode 635 of Anglican Unscripted.